our second speaker, Aurora Thibault, who works with uh, Stephen Lorais. Stephen was also in our very first, one of our very first uh, BCBT events, also uh, via, via Neil. And why we're really happy that Aurora is here is that she, she's really dealing with these whole fundamental questions of, okay, levels of consciousness, how can we get an understanding of, um, let's say, vegetative state, minimal conscious state, coma, how can we differentiate between these different states, and what does it tell us about the brain mechanisms behind, uh, behind uh, consciousness? So Aurora has done a PhD with Stephen Lorais in the ASH, which is in Belgium. Um, then she has done her postdoc in Boston, uh, and she has just returned from Boston back to Liège, where she now really takes on a, a research position in, in the Lares group at the University of Liège, in the hospital, University of Hospital in Liège, where she will advance our insights into levels and states of consciousness. Aurora, I'm really looking forward to your talk. Thanks that you're here. Thank you. Take it away. Thanks. Oh, there's a box there. Okay. <laughs> Okay, good morning still, uh, everyone. So uh, thanks for the introduction and for the invitation. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk about um, coma and related disorder. So it's gonna be more clinical as compared to the previous talk. Um, and so, and then how neuroimaging can help us understanding those kind of disorder, how it can help us in the diagnosis, the prognosis, and also in terms of treatment. So first, I'm going to define how, I mean, clinically, we define a disorder of consciousness. Um, you're going to see it's less complex as compared to what um, Anil explained this morning. Where I'm going to explain what is, uh, how we clinically assess those patients, and finally, how neuroimaging uh, can help us to understand brain function, how it can help us to understand, uh, to detect consciousness, how we can communicate as well with such patients uh, using the, so, such uh, neuroimaging tools, such as MRI, PET scan, and also EEG, and then also how it can um, help us to understand some uh, therapeutic options, or the mechanisms of such uh, therapies. So first, how do we define consciousness? So here, it's, it's very simplistic. So we uh, divide consciousness sub, up, um, in two components. So the first one is uh, the content. Can I do it? OK, here. Um, the content of consciousness, which we call awareness, and then the level of consciousness, which is uh, wakefulness. So I can test if you are aware. Uh, by asking you, for example, a simple response to come, uh, come on, a simple response to command, such as "Okay, raise your arm," and then I can say, "Okay, you are conscious." Then uh, wakefulness is going to be just eyes opening. This is how clinically we can assess those two components, and so they are uh, linearly correlated normally. So here you can see that when you are fully conscious, those two components are at the maximum, and then uh, the more you are uh, asleep, you fall asleep, the less uh, the the less pronounced they are. Then you have a first dissociation, which is uh, M ERM uh, sleep, where in fact you will have. Um, an increased awareness. We can see, I'm going to sh show you later in some PET scan study that the activity, your brain activity is higher, but you still are, you, your eyes are closed, so meaning that your wakefulness is very minimal. And then you have uh, the first pathology, which is coma, and where those two components are at the minimum. You are not uh, awake, so that means that you will never be able to open your eyes. Uh, even with deep stimulation, and you are fully unconscious, so non-aware of your environment. This is also what we want when we do an anesthesia, so um, no wakefulness, no awareness. And then we have uh, those two populations of pa patients we are mostly working with. So it's what we call the vegetative state. Uh, sorry. So the vegetative state, now we call it uh, the unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. So the vegetative state of those patients, they can open their eyes. They recovered some reflexes. So sometimes it's hard to differentiate like a movement, uh, a reflexive movement from a conscious uh, movement. And so those, but those patients, they open their eyes either spontaneously or after uh, stimulation. And, um, but they are 
clinically, at least at the bedside, they are uh, unconscious, so unaware of their environment. This is also what we can see with uh, epilepsy or sleepwalking. So those subjects, they have their eyes open, but they are unconscious. And we have the, the second entity, which is the minimally conscious state. You have the minimally conscious state plus, uh, those patients recovered common following, and then the minimally conscious state minus, uh, those patients only show non-reflexive movements such as uh, visual pursuit or localization to, to pain. So this is how we define consciousness in our um, field. And then we also have what we call the locked-in syndrome, which is not a disorder of consciousness, but uh, I'm gonna talk about it later. It can be misdiagnosed as a vegetative state while those patients are fully conscious. I'm gonna talk about that uh, after. So I just said that the consciousness um, is divided into two components that are uh, linearly correlated. So the more, normally, the more you are aware uh, of arose, the more you are aware, but then, also, uh, the content of consciousness awareness is also divided into two components that are anti-correlated. So the internal consciousness, which is co the consciousness of yourself, and then the external consciousness, the so consciousness of your environment. Meaning that the more you are conscious of your environment, the less you are conscious of yourself. Okay. And those, those two uh, components are um, underlined by different neural correlates. So internal consciousness are going to be um, more internal components, such as uh, the anterior cingulate cortex, the mesiofrontal cortex, and then the precuneus and posterior cingulate cortex, while the external uh, or sensory awareness is going to be more uh, the frontoparietal uh, lateral network. And a study uh, by Van Odenis and uh, Athena Dormercy that has been done like, uh, like, yeah, seven years ago now, showed that, that's the, the, which was with LC subjects, so they asked them to, um, it's, it was like some pictures and the, the subjects were asked to say if it was more internal and external, and they had to rate like from uh, one to four, like one to uh, internal and two, th three, four external, and they showed that indeed um, internal thoughts were more co related to internal here uh, in blue, uh, areas and those areas were uh, correlated and connected while external it was more like the, the frontal parietal uh, cortex. And so those two networks were anti-correlated, meaning that when one is activated, the other one was not activated. And this is really important. We are going to talk about that later as well. So clinically, a patient in coma as I mentioned, will never open his eyes and will never show any uh, behavior that like a response to command or something like that is only going to be uh, reflex behaviors. And this is sometimes uh, difficult to understand, especially for the families, because you say, okay, this patient, in my, my son or whatever, um, I'm touching him and he moves, so I'm, I'm sure he's conscious. And I'm going to show you a video. The patient is a 42-year-old man who met criteria for brain death following a large pontocerebellar hemorrhage. In the first 24 hours, a complex sequence of movements was observed. The videotape shows the patient displaying a sequence of complex movements on passive flexion of the neck. These movements vary on repetitive passive flexion of the neck. So this patient is in brain death, meaning that there is no brain activity, it's not even coma or vegetative state, there is like no chance of recovery, like zero, from um, 1950, all the patients in brain death, none of them recovered. Like when we say that someone recovered after brain death, he was not in brain death, it's really, at least so far, uh, it was never seen. But you see that these patients, even though he wa he's in brain death, meaning that there's no, really like no, no cortical activity, still has some movement when we uh, leave, uh, we left his, his uh, neck. So like for a family, you can imagine that it's hard to understand that in fact there is no 
chance of recovery, right? And so we had to develop some scale to uh, differentiate patients that may recover, uh, that show sign like real sign of consciousness from patients that in fact are like fully unconscious and also um, that the chance of recovery are, are way lower. And so the second uh, entity after a coma, so the patient after a coma, they will recover eyes opening, but still no sign of uh, consciousness. So this is what we call the vegetative state, and we recently decided to change uh, the name to unresponsive wakefulness syndrome to avoid this like negative connotation of the word vegetative. So we did a survey with families and, and everything, and so we decided to change it to have it like more uh, objective, uh, more objective uh, name. So it's that represents the, the clinical entity. So those patients are unresponsive but awake. So now we try to use unresponsive wakefulness syndrome instead of uh, vegetative state. And then some, some patients will recover some sign of consciousness, but minimal. So those patients are called minimally conscious states. So we divided um, this state in two. So minimally conscious state minus, which is only um, non-reflexive movement. So, so as I said, visual pursuit, visual fixation, uh, localization to pain, localization to some object, but it's not related to language. When the patient recovered the ability to understand language, such as, uh, for instance, response to command or intelligible verbalization, we say that they are in minimally conscious state plus. Um, and so here it was a study using uh, positron emission tomography, so the PET scan, assessing the brain metabolism. And we see here the patient in minimally conscious state uh, minus, so in blue is the areas that are hypometabolic. And they have the language network here on the left hemisphere is completely hypometabolic, but is more preserved here in patient in minimally conscious state plus. And when we did the comparison between the two populations, indeed, patient in minimally conscious state plus uh, presented a higher brain metabolism within this uh, brain network. And finally, uh, those patients can emerge from the minimally conscious state when they recovered a uh, functional communication. So the first step is going to be to ask them like, uh, to say yes, move your thumb, to say no, move your thumb uh, down. And so we need, usually it's like a, two, a, a yes, no code communication. And uh, so when they recover this ability, then we say that they emerge from the, the minimally conscious state, so they are not in a disorder of consciousness anymore. And then we have uh, the locked-in syndrome. So I don't know if you're familiar with, with this type of patients, but the uh, locked-in syndrome, uh, those patients, in fact, they mostly had a, a lesion of their, in their brain stem. And due to that, they have no uh, motor uh, uh, input, meaning that they can't move, they can't talk. Uh, so they, basically, they can't show us that they are conscious, right? So you ask someone, and but they are fully conscious, though. Their brain is like fully preserved. So you ask them, like, OK, move your thumb. And they're like, yeah, I can do it, but I just can't. I mean, you know, and they really try. And you imagine at the intensive care, like, they just got this massive like, stroke, and they are not understanding what is happening to them, so it's like really, really challenging, and so it, it, they don't know that they, you know, how to show that they are conscious, so it's really, really uh, hard. Um, and, but do, after a while, they can recover like eyes movements, so basically they, what they do is like to say, yes, they, they look up to say no, they look down or left or right or something like that, or they blink. So usually they still have such uh, eyes movements, but not all the time. We have an entity which is called uh, the complete locked syndrome, and in, with those patients, only neuroimaging can show that they are uh, still conscious. In fact, they have no way to show us. We had a couple of cases, but, but yeah, yeah, thank God it's really, 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 really rare. So yeah, in the intensive care, neuroimaging can help us to, to also diagnose those uh, patients in locked-in syndrome. Um, and also something else that we have is not like, this is what now we call the minimally conscious state star, is patients as locked-in syndrome that can't show that they are like conscious, but uh, they still have uh, some preserved uh, brain function. So they look vegetative or unresponsive, but in fact, when uh, we do some motor imagery, uh, like uh, brain computer for us to, to communicate with them, we, we see that they still have preserved uh, active brain activity. And so, but 
it's a pity with those patients because clinically we can't interact with them because they just can't show us that they are conscious. We can't ask them questions, but you were using neuroimag uh, neuroimaging, yes. Um, maybe one day we would be able to, to interact better with them. And so here I have a video of uh, locked in patients that um, communicate, uh, in fact, they can write uh, using also. So he can basically write only using his eyes, which is pretty much amazing. And you see there is no movement, like no, there is just, yeah. So basically with his eyes, you can select a, le uh, um, a letter on the screen that you can see here. And right, of course it's pretty slow, but uh, he can communicate and uh, interact with his family or just say, okay, I am in pain. And you see, like, he, he's writing. And then there is a patient that actually wrote a book like that, telling this high story, um, Bobby. It is really, really impressive. So, yeah. thank you. So here we have uh, an MRI and a PET scan of a patient in lactin syndrome. And so here this is a lesion on the brain stem, and then you, but you see that the brain metabolism is fully preserved and as in a LCE controlled. So most of the time the doctor made the diagnosis, but also in almost uh, one third of the case, this, uh, the, fami the family just showed that th in fact their, their um, family member is conscious. Okay, so to uh, sum up, so after an acute brain injury, the patient goes to a coma, which is so no uh, wakefulness, no awareness. Then you can, most of, in most of the cases, uh, fully recover or go to a lactin syndrome or brain death, which is death. And then uh, some patients goes to, uh, go to a vegetative state or unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. They can either be what we call the permanent vegetative state, but now we try to avoid seeing that because sometimes, uh, even in years, that there are more and more studies showing that those patients in permanent vegetative state, in fact, can still recover even three, four, ten years after the injury. Um, and then we have the minimally conscious state. So here it's like a minimally, uh, um, those patients are minimally conscious, so they show like very, very, I mean, they can't communicate, but they can respond to command and so on. And they can either recover, uh, but still have really high cognitive uh, damage, and are what we call now the permanent minimally conscious state, but still we don't know uh, if it can be permanent. We have, like most of the patients still evolve even years after injury, they can recover a communication, which is extremely important because they can say, at least for instance, if they're in pain, if they wanna, I don't know, watch TV or so on, so it's like, it's really basics for us, but for them it's highly important. Okay, so how can we clinically assess those patients? Because so far it's still the gold standard. No, I mean, no, not all of the hospital have access to MRI, MRI PET scan, uh, high density EEG, so still now what we use is um, uh, clinical assessments. So here, sometimes there is a differentiation between cognitive ability and motor uh, capacity. So here, patient in coma, they have no motor function or, uh, and no cognitive function either, but then they recover uh, eyes opening. So what we call unresponsive wakefulness syndrome here. And then they recover some uh, awareness of the minimally conscious state. And finally, the communication, which is the most important, as I said, and then, but still, the word is still long to a, a full recovery. Okay, so w the best scale we have so far, but still is not uh, sufficient, uh, is the coma recovery scale. So we did a study uh, almost 10 years ago now when we asked the doctor to um, diagnose the patients. So we did that with 126 patients and uh, 51 were considered as being unresponsive. So no sign of consciousness, nothing. And then we did the coma recovery scale with those uh, patients, and in fact we found out that 
18 when were actually minimally conscious, meaning that the rate of misdiagnosis was between 30 to 40 percent, which is enormous. Even more, knowing that the chance of recovery, I'm going to show you that later, are way different between vegetative and responsive patients and minimally conscious state patients. So this is a uh, coma recovery scale revised. It's uh, divided in six subscales, so auditory function, visual function, motor, our motor, communication, and arousal, okay? And then you have the small stars here uh, for the diagnosis of minimally conscious state plus. So this scale is made to disentangle unresponsive patients from uh, minimally conscious patients. And we also compare this scale uh, with other scale, and maybe some of you know the Glasgow Coma Scale, which is always used uh, in uh, intensive care. And so here, with the co uh, Glasgow Coma Scale, out of 77 patients, 24 were diagnosed as being minimally conscious, but with the Coma Recovery Scale, 45 were diagnosed as being minimally conscious. So the scale you use is uh, really, really important and matters a lot. So, of course, we all recommend to use the, the coma recovery scale. The way you perform this scale is also really important. So, we did a couple of studies and we uh, found out that, for instance, to assess visual pursuit, which is one of the first sign, uh, the clinical sign of consciousness that patients recovered, you, it's way better to use a mirror so the patient can see their his own reflection. You also better uh, test the auditory function by calling the patient by his own name and not just like a regular random sound. And also like the way you do, uh, you test the reflexes, etc. So we need to know that those patients have mo severe motor deficit, they have aphasia, blindness, uh, fluctuation of vigilance, they're in pain. So there are like many, many, many factors that can affect their responsiveness, okay? So we really need to be um, cautious about that. And we recently showed that we need at least five assessments to reach the, the best diagnosis. So you need to, do, to perform this scale at least five times within a two weeks period to make sure that you did not miss any sign of consciousness. Okay, so why it is so important to, to see if a patient is conscious or not? Okay, so um, this is a study with 116 patients, and so we followed those patients um, for 12 months. So we did an assessment after a month, three months, six months, and 12 months using this coma recovery scan revise. And here you have the vision that we're in vegetative, vegetative state at one month. Uh, and so in red, that's the patient in vegetative state. In black, the patient in, in, uh, that died. Blue is in minimally conscious state, and green, the patient who recovered, okay? So you see that uh, at one year, almost 60% of the patients are either dead or still in a vegetative and responsive wakefulness syndrome. And like a small proportion became um, minimally conscious and only 30% recovered uh, functional communication, which is a really, really uh, small percentage. And so this is for the traumatic, sorry, this is for a traumatic etiology. Then if a patient showed a sign of consciousness that could be just a visual pursuit at one month post injury, you see that 20%, uh, 25% are still in minimally conscious state. A very, very few are in minimal, uh, vegetative unresponsive wakefulness syndrome, like 15% died, but almost more than 50%, in fact, recovered a functional communication or even more. So that's why it's so important to uh, see, to assess, and to detect sign of consciousness of patients as soon as possible, because the chance of recovery are way different. And this is for patients in non-traumatic uh, etiology, and you can see that, in fact, their chances of recovery are way lower as compared to a traumatic etiology, so the etiology of uh, your injury is also highly important here. Like, almost no patient, in fact, at one if at one month, a patient, like an anoxic patient had no sign of consciousness, his chances of recovery are almost known. Okay. While for patients in minimally conscious state, even though it's from a non-traumatic etiology, they still have 30% uh, of chances to, to recover. <laughs> 
So now we're going to talk about neuroimaging. So we have a lot of options to uh, assess brain activity. We can assess brain function. Uh, we can assess cardiac function, everything. So we usually use in our, um, in our university hospital in Liège, uh, we use fMRI, uh, high-density EEG, FDG, PET scan that assess the um, brain metabolism, and we also have uh, EEG TMS. And so, as I said, we can measure uh, the, brain, the brain structure and also the brain function using different paradigms. So we can measure the brain at rest. We can measure the brain using passive paradigms, that's just listening to music, or using active paradigm, like, for instance, asking the patients to move his, uh, like, imagining to move his hand or imagining playing tennis, etc. And so... Um, it can help us, for, of course, to understand the brain function, but also to detect consciousness for those patients that are unable to, like for instance, they are like fully paralyzed, and so they can show us that they are conscious, and also to communicate with them and to understand uh, the mechanisms of some uh, drugs or therapies. So this is a very old study now, um, done par by uh, Stephen Norris in 2004. So he scanned patients using positron, uh, positron emission tomography, so PET scan, FDG PET scan, in different state of consciousness. Um, patients that, are, that had uh, normal uh, like LC control. And he saw that those patients had like 100% of brain metabolism. Then, you remember, we talked about brain death, so no brain activity. And in, in, indeed, you see, this is what we call also the black bus syndrome. There is no, I mean, everything is dark, no brain function at all. The only like, purple spherical that you see is basically the skin, the skull, so no brain activity. Then um, they also scan patient in, uh, subject, not patient, uh, in deep sleep, and they saw that they had like 50% of uh, their global brain metabolism, okay? So here we say, okay, maybe consciousness is, is like an on-off phenomena. Like, if you're conscious, your brain metabolism is up, and if you're not, then your brain metabolism is down, okay? So this is what they saw here when the patient, where uh, the subject were in uh, rapid eye movement sleep, then they, like, they were like dreaming, then the, recover, the brain metabolism goes up. Same thing with anesthesia, like deep anesthesia, brain metabolism goes down, they recover from anesthesia, brain metabolism goes up, okay? Patient in a vegetative or unresponsive wakefulness syndrome, they only have like 40% of uh, global brain metabolism preserved. So you see everything is blue, so there is almost no brain function anymore. And then this is a patient that recovered from the vegetative state. However, you see there is almost no difference, okay? So by this study, they found out that no, consciousness is not an on-off uh, Phenomenon, it's there are specific brain areas that has to be important to, for the recovery of consciousness, okay? So the global brain function does not tell us everything. So here, um, what they found is that w one critical area for the recovery of consciousness is what we call the precuneus. So this area here, this red triangle, and indeed, you see that in LC control, it's highly uh, metabolic. It's like no metabolic at all in a vegetative state. In locked-in syndrome, it's uh, like this is only one patient, so it's like uh, highly preserved. And then in minimally conscious state, patients is like 50% preserved. And indeed, we saw like uh, in uh, yeah, 10 years ago, a study showed that in fact the recovery of the connectivity between the preconis and um, uh, the the, yeah, the connectivity with the precuneus uh, was a diff like that how the patient recovered uh, consciousness afterwards. So the patient was in vegetative or minimally conscious state. In fact, he was in minimally conscious state, and then he recovered, and uh, it was due to the, the connectivity with the precuneus. Same thing here. Um, they found out that what is highly important is the in fact the connectivity with, with within and between this what we call the, um, 
So the default network, the uh, internal consciousness network and the external consciousness network, basically. So this frontal, parietal network, external and internal. So the preservation of those areas is essential, but the connectivity within and within this network is highly important uh, as well. And so this is a study that uh, we did like more recently. So we compared the preservation of different brain network and we targeted like specific brain regions. So either all, like the cortical areas, the frontal part, the specif specifically the frontal parental network, the precuneus and the entire cortex. And you see here the specificity uh, uh, of patients in vegetative state through uh, like minimal conscious state and emergence. And the best one to um, differentiate patient in minimally conscious state from a patient in vegetative state is the frontoparietal cortex. So just targeting, looking at this uh, external cor uh, consciousness net network, so the frontoparietal cortex, you can uh, better differentiate a patient in vegetative state from patient in minimally conscious state. And indeed, when you will look at the brain metabolism here of the patient in, in unresponsive wakefulness syndrome or vegetative state, is that this network, uh, so frontoparietal, is highly hypometabolic, but is more preserved in patient in minimally conscious state. Okay. And um, also a highly important um, connection that needs to be recovered for patients to recover consciousness is the uh, frontothalamic connectivity. So here, it's also a very old study now. Um, they scanned a patient while, while he was in vegetative state and then while he recovered consciousness and they found that the different, like what the patient recovered in fact was not like the metabolism within all the network but only between the thalamus and the prefrontal cortex. So that's why when you scan a patient, the global brain metabolism can be the same, but in fact, the connectivity between the prefrontal cortex and here the thalamus was recovered. Okay, and that's the only difference they found with that patient. And so here, it's, I mean, um, I don't know if you know that deep brain stimulation, but based on that, um, it's a the team of Nicola Schiff in New York. So they decided to try to stimulate the, the recovery of the frontoparietal, uh, the, between the thalamus and the prefrontal cortex. So what they did, they implanted uh, electrode in the intraliminar nuclei of the, the, the thalamus. And the first patient that received this surgery, in fact, recovered um, really well because he was in minimally conscious state before, so only able to show some response to command. And after the surgery, when he was on, on period, so when they activated this, uh, this, this stimulator, the patient was able to talk and eat alone, to read, so the recovery was really, really impressive. But this is a really nice story. Uh, then they tried with other patients, and it's not always the, the case. But the first patient, yeah, it, it, the, the recovery was pretty impressive. So this was uh, with PET scan, and um, we also have uh, other techniques such as EEG. The advantage, of course, of EEG is that it's portable. You can go to the patient's bedside, put the cap, and that's it. While with uh, PET scan is invasive, you have to, you know, uh, inject uh, glucose. You have to scan the patient. Sometimes he needs to be anesthetized, so it's kind of uh, difficult for the, those such patients. So we try to find uh, other techniques that are less invasive and easy to apply. So here we see uh, high density. Uh, EG, so here there are uh, 256 electrodes. And so we uh, found out that, in fact, the difference between patient in unresponsive wakefulness syndrome and patient in minimally conscious state, what differentiates the two of them after uh, listening to a specific paradigm, it was um, like different types of sounds, basically. So they found out that, in fact, patient in vegetative state, they had this um, activation of the, uh, in the auditory cortex, but what they don't have is that the connection then with the prefrontal cortex and the feedback from the prefrontal cortex to the auditory cortex. So this is also a way to distinguish uh, those two uh, populations. So this feedback is not existing in unresponsive uh, patients. So here is uh, a study using, again, fMRI. 
So they uh, scanned the patient at rest, so they were not asking anything, it was just uh, at rest, and they found out that the connectivity within the default mode network, so this network here, is like the less the patient in con is conscious, the less the, 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 the connectivity is preserved. So it is fully preserved in uh, LC control and locked in syndrome patients, and then the less the patient is conscious, like here it's minimally conscious state, vegetative state, and coma, then the less the connectivity is uh, less preserved. And when you compare a patient in vegetative state from minimally conscious state, then the main difference is in the precuneus, the, crit the critical hub I talked about earlier. Okay. Then also uh, they did more uh, complicated, uh, complex analysis. So this is a study that was done by uh, Athena de Merzi and uh, Georgios Antonopoulos. So they uh, split the, the different networks. So in LC control, so this is the default mode network, then the front operator network, science, auditory, sensory, motor, and visual. Um, and so they assess the connectivity within those networks in patients with mi in minimally conscious state and vegetative state. And what they found out that the best one to dis disentangle the two populations, so vegetative from minimally conscious, is the auditory network. And that this auditory network is highly uh, connected also with the sensory motor one and the visual one. Meaning that to show consciousness, you really need a high uh, sensory motor and uh, multi-sensory uh, 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 network preservation. So they did on this on 59 patients and then they use other data set uh, to check this, uh, uh, this classifier. And so they found that in uh, using this auditory network only, they were able to uh, disentangle 80, like to correctly diagnose 80% of patients in minimally conscious state. Uh, another study by Carol Di Perry. Uh, she, here, she looked at hyperconnectivity because we also always think about hyperconnectivity between the network that there is not connect connection enough, there is no connectivity enough, and so here she had like a different approach and she looked at hyperconnectivity. So basically, it's normally within a network like the, the network we saw here, they need to be uh, highly connected, right? But also, like for instance, and we saw that at the very beginning of the presentation, like the external consciousness network and the internal consciousness network, they are, they are anti-correlated, meaning that when one is activated, the other one shouldn't be, okay? But here, in patients with a disorder of consciousness, there is not such distinction. So two networks that shouldn't be activated at the same time can be activated. So this is what we call hyperconnectivity. So this hyperconnectivity here wasn't seen in uh, LC control, but uh, in patient in, uh, in minimally conscious state. So here, while the, the patient was, uh, they were assessing like the default mode network, and in fact, they found out uh, hyperconnectivity with those uh, areas of the brain that shouldn't be activated in, and they are not activated in uh, LC control. So meaning that they are pathologically activating other brain network that in fact we need some specificity to be conscious and when you are using the different brain network, you shouldn't like activate your prefrontal network, for instance. So another technique uh, that we use a lot in clinic, uh, it's the PET scan and this is what we use to assess the patient more individually. And um, this is a study that was done by uh, Johan Stender and Olivia Gersowitz a few years ago. So they look at the clinical diagnosis of every patient. Uh, and so here you see patient in minimally conscious state, and so in blue is the hypometabolic area, and in, green, uh, in red, sorry, the preserved area, okay? So this is the typical scan of a patient in vegetative state, so everything in blue. Uh, this is artifact, and there are some, sometimes some preservation in the brain, brain stem, but that's it. And this is a typical uh, PET scan of a patient in minimally conscious state. So some areas are preserved, but many of them as well are uh, hypometabolic, okay? And so here what they showed is that at the single subject level, the PET scan could uh, diagnose 
at like within a specificity of uh, 85 85 percent uh, the patient in minimally conscious state so they were congruent with the clinical diagnosis but then uh, so yeah and then the sensitivity with oops sorry uh, minimally conscious state was 93 percent so extremely high there is no other neuroimaging technique that can reach such a uh, sensitivity and there were also what well, it was really uh, also really good with the uh, overall outcome prediction oops sorry so here in fact it was patient in vegetative states that showed a preserved metabolism that were comparable to uh, patient in, in minimally conscious state and in fact 75% of the 74% of those patients actually recovered after so as a prediction it was also uh, uh, really good so this is what we see here also, uh, so those patients were uh, in vegetative state clinically at the bedside, but the PET scan was uh, really more close to many many conscious state, and actually those patients recovered um, consciousness afterward. And then also now we come back to the global brain metabolism. So at the beginning, I told you that in fact, it was the consciousness was not everywhere in the brain. That's true. There is specific network that are essential for uh, the recovery of consciousness. However, now we did more uh, specific analysis using different techniques and different uh, uh, paradigms. And so we redid this um, calculation of global consciousness. And we found out that in fact, we have this threshold of 42% of global brain metabolism. And when the patient in, in, sorry, in unresponsive weightfulness syndrome here, so all those uh, white dots, it's the patient that are uh, unresponsive wakefulness uh, in unresponsive wakefulness syndrome at the bed bedside. And then, in fact, the, the, the black dots are patients that recovered afterward, okay? And so you see that above this threshold, almost all the patients that were clinically unresponsive, in fact, they recovered. If they had more than 50, uh, third, sorry, 42 percent of global brain metabolism preservation, while patients in minimally conscious state, almost all of them, they were above this threshold. All of uh, patients who emerged from the minimally conscious state. So this is also a simpler technique as compared to the regional. Uh, uh, brain metabolism analysis. So this can be really easily implemented in, in clinical practice. So you just have, if you have above 40, uh, 42%, then the, the chances for a patient to recover are way higher. Uh, and then we also use uh, EEG. So this was the first study we did using uh, this uh, uh, technique. So we did 24 hours recording uh, and we assessed the uh, uh, sleep wake cycles. So here uh, you see patients in a minimally conscious state and that in fact they showed preservation of this cycle during the day and during uh, the, the night. So during the day they show like more related uh, wake cycle while during the night you see these characteristic uh, waves of sleep uh, wake cycles, okay? So while patients in unresponsive wakefulness syndrome they had the same everywhere. There's, there were no distinction between cycle of uh, when they were awake, so in fact, I, just eyes opened, and where they were, in fact, you thought they were, they were sleeping, but in fact, they are were just uh, closed, and so there were no distinction between the two. But of course, it's going to be really hard just to diagnose the patients to do an EEG for 24 hours. So this was really interesting for us because we found out that, in fact, those patients in vegetative state, even though their eyes were open in clinically, uh, clinically the eyes were open, in fact, they had no distinction. They had no real sleep-wake uh, cycles, physiological sleep-wake cycles. And uh, more recently, we also looked at the, you know, that the patient in, in minimally conscious state, they clinically, they really fluctuate a lot, meaning that sometimes they can see, uh, they can present a uh, response to command, but then you assess them one hour later and they present nothing. They are clinically in vegetative state. So you need, that's why you need to repeat, uh, you to do several assessments. And indeed, when we look at the entropy, so that can also be a measure of vigilance, you see that here this is a patient in, uh, minimally conscious state. In fact, they fluctuate a, about uh, every about 70 minutes. So they fluctuate really a lot. 
while patients in vegetative state, in fact, they have no fluctuation at all, like the entry is always pretty much the same. And this is our most uh, recent study using EEG. So here we uh, studied, uh, we did connectivity analysis. And so we found out that um, as for the, the PET scan and the MRI, the more the brain is connected, the more the patient is conscious. So you see this nice evolution from the unresponsive wakefulness syndrome to minimally conscious state minus, so non-reflexive uh, sign of consciousness, but no uh, preservation of language. Then patient in minimally conscious state plus, person who emerged from the minimally conscious state, and then uh, locked in and, and LC control represented like a highly connected um, brain. Uh, yeah. And same thing as for the other uh, studies, for patients who are clinically diagnosed in unresponsive wakefulness syndrome but recovered like at one year follow-up, they presented this uh, highly connected uh, brain as well. So EG can now be, be thanks to more uh, complex analysis, can also, could also be used as a clinical tool for um, uh, the diagnosis of other, uh, yeah, to distinguish patients in minimally conscious states from unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. However, it, it, it took, I don't know, two years to analyze all the data, so yeah, the family shouldn't be too uh, in too hurry to yeah, know the, the results, so we still need to find a way to translate uh, all those findings to like real uh, clinical life. And this is, was a really nice uh, study, I mean, from a clinical point of view, because, so here we asked the patients, still using EEG, but so it was uh, active paradigm, so uh, we, the patient had to do a, a task. So we asked a patient to count the number of times he uh, list, like heard his own name. So like, like random names were presented and then his own name as well. And so you see here when the, his own name is presented that you have what we call the uh, P300 or P3 here. So you have like a uh, real difference between here it's when the own names are presented and then in blue when the random uh, names are presented. And this is uh, yeah, like what we see in LC control and then patient in minimal conscious state and then no, uh, nothing in patient in vegetative state. And this patient, in fact, one of them was, uh, so in locked in syndrome, one of these patients was uh, in like complete locked in syndrome, so not even eyes movements. We were, all of us were sure that this patient was in vegetative state, nothing, like there is no dope, no clinical sign of consciousness. And when we did this test with uh, her, and we found out that she presented that this P3 as much as in uh, LC control. And then, so we were like, okay, that's really surprising. Then we did the PET scan, and in fact, we realized that her brain metabolism was as high as a LC, like an LC patient. And so um, we, we were able to diagnose her as being in locked-in syndrome. So of course, her cares and everything changed a lot. Now we still cannot communicate with her, but she recovered some movements. So th this way, I mean, it's already something. So for the family, of course, uh, I mean, it changed her life and the, fami the life of the, her family like a lot. So it was a really nice. Uh, story. And finally, so this is uh, kind of a new technique as compared to the other one. So all I showed you before, it's only true at the uh, like the so subject, uh, not sorry, not the subject level, but at the population level. So you have some patients that they can have like a really low PET scan and still be minimally conscious. So you can't be sure at 100% that if you don't see this kind of brain metabolism, this kind of uh, um, brain connectivity using MRI, etc., it's not true at uh, the single subject level. Okay. So this is a technique. So it's a TMS EEG. Um, so here you see the device, the pretty uh, big equipment. It's also really expensive. You need to be trained to perform it. The analysis are also complicated. But so far, it's the only uh, tool that can predict either consciousness recovery or uh, diagnose a patient as minimally conscious state, like at the single subject level. Like so far, we never had a, a false positive or false negative. So here I'm going to show you a video explaining the, um, 
So this is based on uh, the patient MRI. So we need to, we still have to do an MRI before to locate uh, the the point to stimulate. And then, in fact, the EEG will register how the brain reacts to this TMS uh, stimuli. So the TMS is transcranial magnetic stimulation, and it will so perturb brain activity, and then the EEG will record. And so when you are conscious. It is the way your brain reacts to the, stimul to the stimulus, okay? So you do uh, a stimulus, you apply a stimulus, and you see how the brain reacts. So it's like, it's kind of disorganized, it's spread, and it varies over time. So then that means that if you want to compress this, brain, this response, it's going to be, the compression is not going to be too low. But if you are unconscious, so this is also based on the information integration theory. So here, the brain, you do like a stimulation, but there is almost no reaction at all, okay? So there is no activity. So it's super easy if you want to compress the response. It's super easy to compress it a lot. So the, the index is going to be very low. And you can also have a lack of differentiation. So that means that the brain will respond a lot, but in the same way. And so same thing here, you kind of compress the, the response and it's also really low. And so this is what we call the PCI, the Perturbational Complexity Index. So you end up having an index and uh, here, the higher the index is, the more complex the response, the brain response is. And then the lower the index is, then the lower uh, the response is. And you have this threshold at uh, 0 0.42 here for like fully conscious patients, and then 0 0.31 for uh, the like disorder of consciousness patients. So all patients in vegetative state had this index below the open 31, while all patients in minimally conscious state or, or that recovered consciousness afterward were above this, uh, this threshold. So, so far, this is the only technique that can really diagnose uh, patients or assess consciousness as a single subject level. But of course, it's like, the equipment is super expensive. You need to get trained uh, to, to be trained to uh, to apply, etc. And the analysis still take time. So we need to also to find a way to make everything easier to be uh, used in clinical practice. But so yeah, so this is the so far the only technique that is um, able to really assess consciousness and be uh, accurate, 100 uh, percent accurate. And so they also did that with uh, patients that were uh, in deep sleep, that with a different kind of anesthetic agents, and still the same, always above this threshold of 0 0.31. So this is what we do in our in Liège. We usually see patients uh, in for like a week. And then we do all these assessments, so the PET scan, the fMRI, we also do DTI to see basically the white matter here, or the cables, the brain cables. We do also uh, motor imagery, I'm gonna explain it uh, right after. And uh, here you see a typical patient that is in uh, vegetative unresponsive wakefulness syndrome, and here a patient that is in minimally conscious state. So thank, to all those type of neuroimaging techniques, we can really uh, help know, like, with the prognosis, the diagnosis, of course, with the prognosis of the patients as well. Okay. And so now I'm going to uh, talk about how those uh, uh, neuroimaging techniques can help us to communicate with patients. So for patients that cannot, like express that they are conscious or like minimally conscious, so you can't communicate with them. But then uh, with such technique that because they are not just not able, like they, they lost uh, too much motor, motor function or so on. And then uh, with those uh, fMRI or EEG, they can really uh, show that they are conscious and not only conscious, but that they can uh, communicate. So that's a study uh, by uh, Martin Monti and Audrey Van der So here, um, you see that when you ask someone 
to imagine to play tennis, it will activate the supplementary motor area. And when you ask uh, this person to imagine uh, uh, to walk in his own house, it's going to uh, activate the, like for instance, the parapunk and pal uh, area. And then here it was a patient that were really no sign of consciousness, so really like nothing at the bedside, and still he was, uh, this patient was able to acti correctly activate those two brain regions when he, he was asked to imagine playing tennis or to uh, imagine to walk in his house. And so as it was like so obvious and impressive, what they, yeah, that's the same thing. Yeah, they, they, what they did is like, okay, when you want to say yes, you just have to imagine playing tennis. And when you want to say no, then you imagine to walk in your house, okay? And then this patient that was at the bedside, like no sign of consciousness, like nothing, it was able to correctly answer to six, uh, to five out of six questions. So it was questions such as, uh, is your father name Alexander? Is your father name John? Blah, blah. And so he was able to correctly answer to five out of six uh, questions. So it was pretty impressive to see. So this is the patient scan. So you see that it's a huge brain region, uh, lesion, sorry. But still, the patient could uh, communicate, in fact. So after a few uh, other assessments, we could detect a response to command, but still we were, we were not able. Like even now, we, we still uh, have contact with the family, but still now, even though we know that he can communicate, he, he understand, but every time we want to communicate with him, we have to put it in a scanner, but because still now we are not able to clinically communicate with him. So because of uh, huge motor lesion or common. So of course, since you can't like put a patient in a scanner every time you want to ask uh, him a question, so we try to do the same with EEG, which is way easier to apply in, uh, in clinics. So we did another uh, paradigm. So here we asked uh, the subject to move their food that activates like a more lateral area, uh, uh, um, central area, sorry, and then to uh, imagine to move uh, their hand, which is a bit uh, more lateral. And this is the example of a patient that, again, was clinically unresponsive and then uh, but was able to correctly activate both uh, areas when he was asked to do so. But again, it needs, even though it's easier to apply in clinical practice, we need to uh, do very, like it takes a week to analyze the, the response of a patient. So we still need uh, further studies to, to be able to like, you know, have like a direct feedback. And uh, another, I have no idea about the time. So, okay, great. <laughs> So uh, this is also a really nice study we did uh, with uh, Camille Châtel in collaboration uh, with the Center of Germany. And so here we use uh, the pupil response. So that's also easy to apply in clinics. So I'm gonna show you the video. So basically, yeah, they place these uh, nice glasses that record basically the pupil size, okay? And so yeah, here you see the pupil size. And what they are gonna ask is to do uh, an aromatic problem. And so if the subject uh, wants to say yes, then he has to perform the, the, the task. And if you want to say no, then you have to do nothing, OK? So basically, when you do this aromatic kind of uh, problem, then your pupil size will uh, increase. And if you do nothing, it should stay the same. And so here, for instance, he doesn't do the task. And then the, the pupil size should say, uh, uh, the same, and then when you want to perform the, to say yes, then you just take, uh, perform the task. And so same thing uh, as with the EEG, they did that with patient in vegetative state, minimally conscious state, and the, the patient, some patient in vegetative state, and a lot of patients in minimally conscious state were able to correctly uh, perform the, 
the, the task. So again, they, clinically, you can't communicate with them, but in fact, they present higher cognitive function than what we, we think. Okay, so now let's move to uh, the, the treatments and how uh, neuroimaging can help us to understand the, um, how treatments work. So, so far we are really limited in terms of treatment options. Uh, only amantadine have shown to really be useful and to increase sign of consciousness to a large population of, of patients. And so to understand the effect of amantadine, uh, Caroline Schnecker, she scanned the patient when he was um, at baseline and then under amantadine. And in fact, the difference between uh, baseline and what the patient was under amantadine was uh, the patient, in fact, recovered the brain activity within the frontoparietal network here. So internal and external, supporting that this network is essential for the recovery of consciousness. So in fact, we think that uh, yeah, the way amantadine works is by increasing brain metabolism in this, those specific brain regions. And then we did the same with uh, Zolpidem. So Zolpidem is a sedative agent that usually we give to people to basically sleep. Uh, but in some rare cases, it, it had like opposite effect in patients in minimally conscious state. So you give that to this patient, he can only present like a response to command. And then after uh, like a half an hour after taking this pill, this, the patient can read, talk, and be like almost normal. So it's pretty, pretty impressive. It's like I saw a couple of patients like that, and you can like walk. It, it's really impressive, it's like a magical pill. But uh, it works in more or less like 6% of patients in, in minimally conscious state. So we can't give, I mean, we try with everyone, but uh, very few response to, to such a drug. And also the other, other bad side is that uh, the effect goes down. So most of the time, the family has to pick some time, like, okay, during the weekend, I want, I want my mom to be awake. And so you have to give only like, like a specific time because if you give like that all the time, then there is, after a few months, there is no effect anymore. And so we try to understand like the, also the mechanisms of this uh, drug, so that's alpidem. And so we scan three responders uh, under placebo and then under uh, zolpidem. And again, what we, we uh, saw that under zolpidem, in fact, the, there is a, um, a recovery of a brain metabolism in this uh, prefrontal region, both internal, medial, and external prefrontal uh, regions. And so we think that, again, it's gonna, it was a connect, uh, the recovery of a connectivity between um, here, the prefrontal cortex, and uh, the thalamus and other uh, internal brain region because of the mechanisms of zolpidem that is acting mostly in the in the striatum. I'm gonna review that later. And another uh, brain um, technique that we uh, used so that we tried the first time like five years ago and. We, uh, it's TDCS, so it's transcranial direct current stimulation. So it's basically you just apply a recurrent over the brain. Here it was the prefrontal uh, cortex, as you can see here. And you, put, you have two electrodes, an anode and a cathode, and the current goes from the anode to the cathode. So basically you stimulate the prefrontal cortex here. And we found out that almost 50% of the patient in minimally conscious state improved uh, just after just one session. So the effects were uh, really nice. And now we are trying to, to apply like uh, four weeks of stimulation, trying to have like longer effects. But then we compared responders from non-responders to understand why some patients responded to such uh, treatment and why other uh, did not respond at all. And so what we found is that the responder had preserved brain metabolism uh, within uh, in this, the prefrontal cortex, uh, the left prefrontal cortex, which is basically the stimulated area. So if you don't have brain metabolism, or also here uh, it was voxel based morphometry, so uh, gray matter um, preservation under the stimulated area, the patient will not improve because you need to some partial preservation, but also uh, in the thalamus here, and the, the precunus. So we, you need to have a preservation of those really critical areas for consciousness recovery to respond to TDCS. Okay. 
So that's why it's also really important to know uh, the patient's lesion, to know, to know because maybe if you, if the patient has a lesion over the left uh, hemisphere, you can place the uh, the, cat, the anode on another brain region, and you, you, the patient is still going uh, to answer, uh, respond to the to the treatment. And so. Uh, this is the Mesier circuit frontoparietal model. So this was proposed by uh, Schiff uh, a few years ago. So this is a really nice model to understand uh, the mechanisms of such treatments. So he proposed this model based on the, um, the Zalpidem responders, why some patients respond to Zalpidem, why it should be a drug that usually is used to, like as a sedative uh, drug. And so, in fact, he thinks that so uh, the striatum usually inhibit the globus pallidus interna here, that inhibits the thalamus. So you have less inhibition of the thalamus thanks to the striatum. Okay, but then when the patient is have a brain lesion, this brain, this area is usually uh, highly um, in, uh, damaged, and so you have less inhibition of the GPI, but then you have more inhibition of the thalamus, okay? So by, uh, thanks to the um, Zolpidem, it's gonna activate this, tria this triatom, so it's gonna have, you have, gonna have more uh, inhibition of the GPI and then less inhibition of the thalamus, uh, which is highly connected with uh, so the fr frontal cortex, the frontal cortex is triatom, and so this can explain why uh, the Zolpidem can be such uh, efficient in some cases. And then you see that the transcranial direct current stimulation that is applied over the prefrontal cortex is also linked to this uh, model. Deep brain stimulation will directly stimulate the, the, the thalamus, and then amantadine will uh, activate more like a more widespread uh, network, which is the, the lateral uh, um, external conscious net network here. So all the drugs that are, were shown to be efficient in such patients were, in fact, uh, playing a role in this uh, mesocircuit frontoparietal uh, model. So now we are trying, of course, to target uh, such areas. But it's, it's just an hypothesis. We still need to, to, to prove this. And so I'm going to uh, now move to the, the conclusion of this presentation. So what we saw is that human consciousness uh, is an emergent property of uh, specific brain networks, so the frontoparietal networks and the connectivity between the thalamus and the frontoparietal network. Okay, sorry. That uh, it's really important to use very specific uh, scale to correctly diagnose patients uh, at the bedside because we know that um, the recovery is really different uh, based on the sign of consciousness that is recovered at the early stage and uh, that we have now some therapeutic options that we can use, and neuroimaging, of course, is really useful to understand those uh, kind of uh, therapeutic options, but also help us to diagnose patients that are not able to clinically show us that they are conscious, but in fact, they have, they're, in, they're in minimally conscious state, and some of them can uh, also be in a uh, higher state of consciousness or even in lactin syndrome. But we still, uh, face a lot of ethical challenges, and I would just like to end with this uh, small test. So what we did is that uh, a couple of years ago, we asked a uh, patient in locked-in syndrome to rate the, the way they were happy in life on a scale that goes from minus five to plus five. Oops. Like, so minus five was the worst period of your life, and plus five is the best period of your life, okay? So if you have to do it like right now, to try to do it like the past two weeks, how much you will rate your, like from a scale that goes from minus five to five, how much are you happy, okay? So you can do it now. And so we ask that to patients in locked-in syndrome. That you, for you, being in locked-in syndrome is like the worst thing on earth. I mean, you and me, I, I can't even imagine being like that. I would like to die if I was in locked-in syndrome. So we ask them to answer this question, and this is their answer. So in fact, the majority of them replied, uh, give, gave a positive number. So we're, in fact, kind of happy 
And when we looked, we compared the answer from patient in lactin syndrome and patient and LC patient like us, and it was not significantly different. So again, at the group level, we can't say that those patients in an extremely severe condition are less happy than we are. So again, don't judge the book by the cover. However, it, we have to say that like 10% of patients in lactin syndrome ask for anesthesia and are really not happy, that not all lactin patients are happy, obviously, but most of them, in fact, are. They find happiness in other things that we can't imagine when we are uh, fully conscious, uh, fully functional like us. But there might, there might also be a, a pathological euphoria in some of these patients. Can you say it again? There might also be a pathological euphoria in these patients because of global reorganization of their brain. So to what extent can you really compare that to a healthy control? You mean because of the reorganization of their brain? Like we, we did a lot of study with them and we have we have no thing so far that proved that the, the, the brain is like reorganized as compared to LC control. So it's more something empirical or that is like we have no proof of that. Like it's not like for, I mean with the technique we have so far, we couldn't show that their brain was Different from the our brain, but uh, yeah, of course. I mean, yes, they they had to find a way to to be happy that we we can't get. But yeah, that's it. So thank you very much for your attention, and this is all my colleagues that did all the the work in Liège and with all our collaborators as well. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, any questions? I have a curiosity. Uh, patients that were unresponsive and were under the treatment of one of the drugs like amantadine or uh, zolpidem, did they remember something, uh, let's say in a, in a second uh, mm -hmm. period of treatment? Did they remember a previous period? Or? Yeah, that's a really good question. And we, we asked, of course, the, the, the questions to, to them, but also to patients that recovered uh, from a vegetative state that were in vegetative state like the day before, and then they recovered like, but this is in the acute stage. And like so far, none of them recalled anything about like wh while they were unconscious or less conscious. So you have a couple of patients that, yes, like the, the hour before there are many, 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 many responsive. And then when they uh, reco recovered some consciousness, higher level of consciousness, and, and they were able to talk and to walk and to eat and, and so on, they couldn't recall. Like it was, yeah, they, they couldn't. So they, yeah, of course, we, we ask them that, but the good thing, I mean, it's that when they are unconscious, they don't really realize that they are in such conditions. So they, are, they cannot say that while they are conscious, they are unhappy about that. And so, but yeah, I think we have the case of a patient that, in fact, he recovered consciousness a bit. He was able to communicate. And then, in fact, it was really hard for the family because she was, I mean, everyone was like so happy that we were able to communicate with them. And then in fact, the patient was way less, ha less happy. And so he asked to, 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 yeah, to, to die all the time because indeed like he was able to realize his condition. And so yeah, this patient was really unhappy because he recovered more uh, consciously. Could, Does age influences the recovery of consciousness in any of these? Um, yeah, the yes, definitely. Them? So uh, we see that older patients, they, they recover less than uh, younger patients, that's for sure. Also something that influenced that is that uh, you saw that traumatic patients recover way better as compared to anoxic uh, etiologies. Uh, and of course, 
traumatic patients must be, uh, the population is younger as well as compared to the anoxic patients that are a bit uh, older. But yes, yeah, age influence the conditions and other factors such as uh, the physical, the previous uh, physical conditions, if the patient was taking drugs, etc. So yes, all those factors influence the, the recovery. Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan, and uh, I grew up in Belgium. So. <laughs> um, and like the edge is a lovely place. Uh, I just, uh, I was curious because uh, I guess uh, these are all these different conditions are quite rare. Um, and I was wondering, in terms of say doing trials of trying some drugs, I mean, how how easy is it really to to, to investigate possible effects of some of these drugs, for instance? Yeah, this is an issue that we are facing every day. It, I mean, thank God it's not a usual uh, condition because you, yeah, we really don't want to have someone or being uh, in such condition. But yes, for all the, our clinical trial, it's really, really difficult. So for instance, we can't do any with Zolpidem because there is not enough responders. Uh, with amantadine, we could, but it was, uh, I mean, we didn't do it, but uh, it was a multicentric uh, trial with like six centers. And for TDCS, uh, the first trial, we, it took us like five years to recruit 50 patients. Uh, and we are doing another one now, and it's again a multicentric uh, uh, trial with like 10 centers, and it still is going to take a few years to, to, to complete the, the study. So indeed, it's, it takes either time or you need to have collaboration, which is also great, to, to get enough patients. Well, so thank you very much. Like this, this drink from the fire hose, right? All these methods that are being used and, and applied. but. So one thing you emphasize is that using this, this complexity measure combined with mm -hmm. this perturbation analysis right. gives you a, a good predictor mm -hmm. right, of outcome. Okay, that's great. But then, of course, we would like to understand why would that work? And then in some sense, the one model that you propose is the sheaf model where you look at cortex, basal thalamus, mm -hmm. and their interactions. So now, do you see these, this measure as also directly mapping onto that model, or do you see them as two independent views on, on these phenomena? Yes, so, uh, yeah, a great point. I think that so far, uh, it's still like two theories, and they both work but for two different things. One is to explain the treatments, and the other one is to explain the consciousness. So the first one is based on the uh, Tonini theory, so which is uh, the integration, integration and, dis and dissociation. And so, that's why they, how they calculate the, the protein personal complexity index. So you need to have both to be conscious. So if one of them is like either the differentiation or the, the integration is low, then the, the PCI is uh, the PCI, so the protein personal complexity index is low as well, and it works amazingly. So that's like kind of gives strength to this, this theory, right? So it is like for, uh, and it works for any kind of conditions, not only disorder of consciousness, but anesthesia and et, and et cetera. So, so this like strengthen the, the, the concept of consciousness. But then that's really for the major circuit. It was the only way we could explain the, uh, the way Zolpidem works. And then that was just a theory. We were just like, we're not sure about that, and like now with, with all the other treatments, we see that so far it works, but that's true that maybe in a couple of years we will see that it's not correct or it doesn't work for all patients, and I'm sure that for TMS we are gonna have an outlier or something like that, but uh, yeah, so, but I think those two models are quite different because one is more, it's based on a theory, like, uh, and the other one more like on, uh, um, anatomical uh, uh, concept of the, the of brain circuits, so it's also really, really different. Okay, but because we have to be careful not to overinterpret the method, right? So what, oh, sure. But what what Tononi does and what he has started out with is to give a complexity measure, mm -hmm. and then it, 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 it's always being advanced in, in very idiosyncratic ways. But the method that gives you a number to describe a complex system. Is, is not the same as having a theory, right? Now it's interpreting the method, and yet it's a method. And it's great that it comes out so cleanly, but now to make that classification work, to what extent do you have to tune the, the descriptors to the specific patient? 
right? Because depending on the lesion, the kind of data you're going to get will vary, right? Some leads might not work, others will work. So to what extent are you also individualizing the analysis at the patient level? No, that, that yeah, very really good point. So that's true that, uh, yeah, we need, of course, we need to be really, really, really careful. And so here we target always two brain regions, so the um, somatosomal cortex and then the precuneus. And indeed, that's true that in some patients we have no... Uh, response, like the, the, the index is very low, and in fact it's just due in, to the fact that there is no cortex under the area we stimulate. So indeed, like if we have a lesion in like both sides and we can't, do, uh, we can't get any response, we, we can't trust our data. So that's true that we need to individualize every, I mean, yeah, so we need to do individualize our analysis and we need to be really, really cautious, of, yeah, of course. Hello. Just, uh, well, thanks for, for the presentation. Just one point about uh, s this uh, PCI measure and the integration differentiation. Uh, somehow the, the, the measure goes against the theory of integration differentiation, no? in the sense that uh, the, the, the least compressible, the, the signal that you can compress the least is a pure random signal that it's zero integration and zero differentiation. I, I think probably the data from, from Anil with uh, the, the drugs, it's not about more, it might be not about more conscious or not about more integration or differentiation, just about more, more randomness. So, so just that um, I understand that this measure is the best that has been done so far, but uh, inspired by that, by that theory, but it doesn't uh, follow from the theory in, in the way that it's not assessing what the theory says. No, that's my, my view on that. No? No, sh sure, yes, um, thank you for your questions. But um, so here I think it works for such cases of patients that are in dramatic conditions such as vegetative state or minimally conscious state. It works with like deep anesthesia and, every, and such really like there is no doubt about being conscious or, or not. But that's true that if we do different ty type of, you know, conscious, uh, we test it in different type of uh, more conscious conditions or person like, and we assess different things and we, the, the concept might not work and we, we are not gonna. So I think it may work for such dramatic conditions, but it's true it's, it may not be like, like or support this theory in other type of conditions. Can I just um, follow up quickly on, it's a very interesting point. Uh, there's a, there's a difference in the interpretation of the compressibility algorithm, the lentil ziv, when it's applied to the TMS evoked data, as you show, as, as in the PCI, and when you apply it to the spontaneous data, as we did in our studies of sleep and anesthesia and also the, the psychedelic drugs. The thing is, when you apply it to spontaneous data, it really is kind of a pure measure of signal diversity. Um, and so the higher the measure, the less compressible. It's just a measure. Of, there's not really any, any implication about integration going on. But when you apply it to the, the TMS evoked data, and as in PCI, you're applying it to a signal that is responsive to a, to a specific and localized perturbation. So there is a sense in which it, there is also some integration going on, because otherwise you wouldn't have an evoked response to assess the compressibility of. Um, if there was no integration, you'd see no response, there'd be nothing to compress. It's a bit, it's just something I've argued with Marcello Massimini about quite, quite a lot, but I, he would argue, I think it is more defensible that PCI does reflect the sort of theory of combined integration and differentiation a bit more than simply applying it to spontaneous data. I think what's, what's lacking is, um, and maybe you know, but there's, I don't think there's any empirical comparison within subjects of how these two measures of compressibility of evoked and compressibility of spontaneous data relate. We've been looking at some models to see when they, you know, are there parameter spaces where they go together, where they come apart, and there are, because they're measuring different things. But whether that's an empirically useful dissociation, we don't know yet. To make a computational model to, and you want, I want to get a model that gets a really high score there, I can have a model that responds like randomly to, to one stimulus. And like a, I suppose uh, you can create the kind of network that you show that it's not a network that does integration and differentiation, 
this kind of network can give you a very high score in a perturbation, simulated perturbation. So it's just like there is like a paradox in the, in the fact that this is precisely the method that it's giving you now the, 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 the best outcome in an empirical. So it's, it's a method that it's a more reliable, but it's not a method that follows, as you pointed in your presentation, clearly from the, from the ideas of uh, uh, integration and differentiation. So. You know, I think this is more about like the theory of, of consciousness rather than being able to diagnose. And that's true. That 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 what I meant. So sorry if I didn't say so. And like to answer your question. So that's true. That we are still working a lot. I mean, and trying to understand um, like the difference of responses between the patients, trying to target other brain regions to, to see if uh, we're gonna get other. Uh, uh, like uh, response, we also try to de decompose the sick line like over time. So we have a study that will uh, go uh, uh, pretty soon about that, like how really the brain responds for every patient in like a five minutes window or a three minute window. And also now um, this um, uh, new uh, study we're gonna do soon is to see how uh, the brain will react to other type of stimulus. Like because TMS is really hard to, to do, so we are do, gonna do a, a, like a, a music study, auditory stimuli, so to see if the brain reacts the same and if it's, it's still gonna work as well. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> Any more questions? In that case, let's thank the speaker again.